You should. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Zinat Rahman. I'm the executive director of the Institute of Politics, and I'm very pleased to welcome you tonight to a discussion about cities, climate change, and communities of color. Before one of our students formally introduces our guests in a few minutes, I'd like to mention a couple of upcoming events that we have at the IOP and also go over some housekeeping. Um, this Friday, IOP and U Chicago Global are co-sponsoring a midday event at the Rubenstein Forum that will focus on democracy and economic development in Latin America. And we have four former presidents from Chile, Costa Rica, the Dominican Republic, and Mexico um, who will be on that panel. That starts at noon, I believe. On Wednesday, April 27th, former Baltimore Health Commissioner and CNN medical analyst, Dr. Lena Wen, will be joined by WBEZ's Kristen Schorsch for a midday event at Ida Noyes. And also on Wednesday, April 27th, um, I'll be moderating, an, no, I won't, but David will. <laughs> be moderating an even, evening discussion about the legacy of former Chicago Mayor Harold Washington that will feature uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, Cook County Circuit Court Judge Tim Evans, and Don Rose, who served one of, as one of Mayor Washington's political advisors. And for those of you who don't know, David Axelrod was also one of Harold Washington's political advisors. Um, we'll do audience questions tonight, so after the moderated discussion, we'll open the floor to take questions um, from, from all of you, so please line up to ask your questions at the microphone. Um, masks are optional when asking questions per the university's latest guidelines, and as usual, we give priority to the first questions um, to students. Um, and please make sure your cell phones are on silent, and with that, I'll, we'll now hear formal introductions of our speakers from Gertie's Wick Schachter a first year in the college who is planning on majoring in fundamentals and human rights. Please join me in welcoming Gertie to the podium. Hello and good afternoon everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today. My name is Gertie Zwick-Schachter. I'm a first year in the college planning on majoring in fundamentals and human rights. And I am lucky enough to be in the position of student ambassador to Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms through the IOP Pritzker Fellows Program. I'm excited to introduce this conversation about how mayors grapple with the effects of climate change in their communities. This discussion will address the particular threat that climate change poses to communities of color and those living in large cities, and the effectiveness of prior attempts to mitigate this threat, as well as potential future policies. We will be hearing the perspective of former Atlanta mayor and city councilwoman, as well as current IOP Pritzker fellow, Keisha Lance Bottoms. Mayor Lance Bottoms was a visionary leader in bringing equitable outcomes to the forefront of government and commerce in the position of mayor, and was the first mayor in Atlanta's history to have served in all three branches of government. We will also be joined by the former mayor of Greenville, Mississippi, and former IOP Pritzker Fellow and Epic Policy Fellow, Heather McTeer Tony. Mayor Tony also served in the positions of Vice President of Community Engagement, as well as Climate Justice Liaison at the Environmental Defense Fund and Senior Advisor to Moms Clean Air Force. This discussion will be moderated by the director of the University of Chicago Program on the Global Environment, Dr. Sabina Sheikh. Today's event is co-sponsored by the University of Chicago Program on the Global Environment and the Energy Policy Institute. Thank you all so much again for being with us today. Without any further ado, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Sheikh to get us started. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. and. Um, let me just start by saying it's um, a great pleasure and honor to be here on the stage with these two amazing women. And um, I can't wait to hear about um, uh, you know, what they've done in their cities and how they see um, our future with climate change. And so I um, thank you everybody for coming and thank you for having us here. I guess I wanted to start just by way of introduction, um, maybe with a bit of an icebreaker, which uh, is how we start class sometimes, and I know the students don't like it, but let's try it up here and see how it goes. Um, first, I mean, I, just a question that I have is like, how do you become mayor of your hometown? It's an amazing accomplishment, and I'm, I'm curious, what led you to that place? Was it a childhood dream or ambition or a well, less direct path? And once that happened, what was, it, what was most important to you with that first day when you became mayor and you walked in, you were inaugurated, what was the most important thing to you? start with Heather? Uh, uh, well, thank you. First, thanks so much for having us. I'm excited. It's wonderful to be sitting here with you. I think this <laughs> is a, probably one of the most amazing seminars. Um, how do you become mayor? You ask people to vote for you. <laughs> that's 
That's what you have to do. Um, I cannot say that it was a childhood dream. It was the fact that things needed to be done. And more often than not, when you see women in leadership, particularly women of color in leadership, it's because we know how to get things done. Mm -hmm. And people trust us with getting things done. And that was the situation uh, in my hometown of Greenville, Mississippi. We had not had an African-American mayor or a woman to serve as mayor. And uh, I was elected back in 2004. Um, it, it was a time when the city was suffering from extreme financial uh, strains, and my first day in office, I found out we had no money. So, <laughs> again, it was about, all right, let's jump in here and let's figure out how to get things done, but also recognizing um, that communities want to live and thrive, and it becomes our responsibility to be an asset in that. So it's, mm -hmm. it is being a public servant every single day. Great. Thank you. I, had never thought of running for mayor, quite frankly. Uh, never thought of running for office. I was a magistrate judge. I ended up running for a seat on the Superior Court, and I lost. Uh, best failure I ever had. <laughs> had an opportunity to visit communities across the county and wanted more for my city, my community. And so that's what led me to ultimately run for city council and then mayor. And the great fortune. Uh, of being in the city, they say if you can't see it, you can't be it. Mm -hmm. um, I saw people who look like me in leadership, so it was not far-fetched that, that I could do it. I just had never thought about doing that. Mm -hmm. That's great. I think you both raised something really important that um, in the sense that as, as women in leadership roles or as, as women, we don't it's not necessarily the case that you're aspiring to become this elected official, right? right. But, but you see things that need to get done and you find the way to do it, right? And so I think that's a, that's a really important point that I, I try to think about a lot. So on, on, on topic for tonight, let me start with something that's probably a huge question, but, but quite foundational. I think when we think about the environmental justice movement and in the early days of the movement, um, there, was, there was this perception that it was about um, you know, the, the location of polluting sites, for example, in poor neighborhoods and communities of color, and that's still very much the case. I mean, just look at Chicago and what we've sort of been dealing with here for the past few years, and it's an ongoing problem. But I think what we're seeing, what we've realized over time is that environmental justice is this confluence of deeply rooted economic, environmental, and social conditions that have led to people of color, people in you know, lower e economic groups, um, just being exposed, uneven exposures to pollution and disparate health effects, um, greater vulnerabilities to climate change. So I'm wondering if you could, maybe each of you talk about these root causes of environmental justice, specifically how like historic policies and land development practices have sort of led to these environmental injustices or these outcomes that we see today. Yeah, I think we, when we think about environmental justice as a terminology, it is a construct in the United States that comes out of systemic racist policy that unfortunately we have been, um, <clears throat> that has really been pushed throughout a lot of federal regulations. You look back at the federal housing um, guidelines back in the 50s, 40s and 50s, even going back to the early 30s, there were very specific metrics that, that were in place that created redlining. So you can look at a form from the Federal Housing Administration in the 40s, and it has a line to check for Negro. And that check box is directly correlated to redlining throughout the United States of America in over 100 cities, Chicago being included. Well, when you talk about the practices of permitting and what was put into communities and how we got to a place where you have siting of environmental hazards and pollutions which create toxic air, toxic water, the inability to breathe clean, um, clean air, it comes again and is born out of these policies that put people into these communities. It's not like black and brown and indigenous people chose to live next to toxic sites. It had to do with how they were put there. But I think even going back a bit further, environmental justice has been a part of social justice since the very beginning. I mean, 
1982 Warren County, North Carolina, that's where a lot of people point to in terms of the beginning of the environmental justice movement. But that actually came out of Atlanta because it was through the SELC where you had students that were trained that knew what to do in that space. So it was born out of the civil rights movement. When Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated, he was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee as a sanitation part of the sanitation workers strike to have black people not be considered the same as trash. I mean, you really think about how it started and what environmental justice is, it stems back to the desire to be treated equally like everybody else and having access to the same clean air, clean water, and clean land as everybody else. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I think to put it very simply, when you are talking to communities that may not understand the buzzwords, when you talk about three people on the block have died of cancer or seven people on this street have been diagnosed with cancer and the kids have asthma and all these uh, health issues that have root causes, it gives you a better understanding of what this mm -hmm. movement is about and really what it should be about. Um, and I know that this just this week I saw the story about a cancer cluster that was traced back to a high school. I believe 100 people from this high mm -hmm. school, including several in one family, diagnosed with these very rare cancers. And uh, my understanding from this story is that this high school was built on the site will, where soil was brought uh, from another site and, and they suspect that may be the source of mm -hmm. contamination. And that's what happened in a lot of underserved communities. They were built on cheap land, uh, even in Atlanta, just outside the AU Center in the community that my mother grew up in, uh, this neighborhood, Vine City English Avenue, traditionally poor African-American neighborhood has it's recently been discovered that the soil is contaminated. And my grandfather I was diagnosed very late with ALS, which is very rare and sometimes linked uh, to pollutants and toxins, et cetera. So I immediately began to think, well, about the people in my family who have been diagnosed with cancer and, and how far back was his soul contaminated and what has it, um, how has it impacted the health outcomes mm -hmm. of my family in particular? Um, and so th this is why it's such an important conversation. We may not understand the buzzwords, mm -hmm. but we understand how it impacts our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such, a, it's such an important point. And I think that we're, we're really, I mean, we know a lot about environment and health relationships with respect to asthma, with respect to cancer, but I think we're just scratching the surface of other ones. And so we see, research all the time that environmental exposures are connected to Alzheimer's, to diabetes, to other things that we may not be even considering the environmental dimensions of that in policy or in planning. So I think that's a really important point. Um, it seems like the recognition is growing that um, you know climate change and, and equity are inextricably linked. And I know there was an event with the IOP on Monday on um, climate change in Illinois, and particularly the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. And so I'm, I'm curious, there's, how effective do you think these type of state policies, or in some cases city policies, I know Chicago's working on one as well, that, that link climate change and equity, um, do the strategies to you, do they seem deep enough to counter these historic reasons for inequity? Or are we talking about, you know, we need massive structural change, we need, you know, a Green New Deal for cities and more. Um, I'm just curious if you have thoughts about that. Yeah, I, I think, it is, so do we need massive structural change? <laughs> yes, we do. Um, how do we go about doing it is the part that we're all having this conversation about. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can agree sort of as mayors, you can't silo an issue. Like a, a mayor cannot sit in a seat and say, I'm only going to work on this one particular issue. Because in executive leadership for a city, you're responsible for all aspects of executive leadership in that city. And so to look at the policies on a local level, it's really important that we talk about climate policy in conjunction with the other issues that are happening in the city, like job creation, economic development, health, education, criminal justice reform. Like, it's so important to tie them together 
because for leadership on a local level, that's what they have to do every single day. You wake up in the morning and you don't know if you're gonna have a situation where there is a building falling down because of something that happened or you've got protesters in front of your house or you have to deal with some major health emergency or a multi-billion dollar business is trying to locate in your community. All of these things, they may not sound like they're connected to climate and environmental policy, but in reality, they are. And so connecting the dots in a way that is effective for people who live there, but also to address the climate and environmental issues that that particular community is facing, I think is the big structural challenge that we have to talk about. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's Earth Week, so everybody's excited. You know, <laughs> yeah. Earth, Earth Day is on Friday and everybody's talking about climate and policy. But what do you do next week? What did you do last week? Where are the policy conversations that are taking place in December? Right? It has to be an ongoing integrated part of our conversation. Yeah. And I have my phone under my notes because I have some stats on here, so I don't want you all to think I'm texting while I'm up here, <laughs> if I look on here. But um, I, as I was preparing to come today, I was looking at some really interesting stats. Again, just going back to Atlanta, the percentage of, of uh, the average income that goes towards energy bills and, and housing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. transportation. And as Heather has said, all of these things are interrelated. So when you have 48% of income going towards energy costs, housing, transportation, that's a significant amount of money. That's life altering for many people. Um, but we also know that when we are creating policy, it's not just for today and easing these burdens, these financial burdens quite often. It's about planning for the future. And when you are an elected official, people want things delivered immediately. It is very difficult to get most people to think about the year 2035 with our clean ener energy plan, for example, in the city, or even 2050 when you're talking about what will happen in 2050 when people are looking at their streets and their streets are torn up today and their trash needs to be picked up right now. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very difficult, but we know that's what policy is all about. It is about the future, and as responsible leaders, we don't have the luxury of just thinking about today because the policies and the challenges that we are facing today is because many leaders in the past didn't think about the issues we'd be facing in 2022. I, I love that. It's like we were at, you think about the, the the protests, what do you want? Climate action, when do you want it? In 2050, that's not what you're gonna hear. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that's just not, that's not the term. Uh, it, it is about what's happening and how do you connect it to that energy bill, that, that mother who's got mm -hmm. two kids with asthma, she's you know, working a full-time job, she's a frontline worker and she has a high energy bill. How does this relate to changing her life? Mm -hmm. What are the, the economic opportunities for her and her children? and at the same time is looking to reduce the air pollution from that concrete batch plant that's at the end of her block, you know, that's using this opportunity around new renewable energy to ensure that the church she goes to has charging stations and has uh, an electrification hub. Like, how do we incorporate all these things um, is what we call the cumulative impacts. And I think this is what you were getting to before when we were talking about maybe issues of asthma, diabetes, heart disease, things we haven't calculated. Well, all of these are cumulative impacts that are more prevalent in communities of color. So in, in Atlanta, a Chicago, in, in Oakland, California, you will find more issues that are environmental and climate related, especially in the Southeast, because there are more communities of color that live in the Southeast. But all of these cumulative impacts together is what makes it mm -hmm. harder. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the, the point about the, it sounds very daunting as, as a mayor, you have to deal with these day-to-day -day things. I mean, there's been mayors in Chicago lost because they didn't get the streets plowed in time, right? And I think that dealing with all of that while you're um, trying to think about sort of the, in, you know, climate change is not something that's happening 20 years from now, 50 years from now, it's happening right now, right? And I think that's something that, um, trying to think about that, but also plan for the future, you have to balance budgets, and I think, so it's, it's, I mean, I guess the question I have about that then is what, 
what can mayors do? Like what's within the purview or the jurisdiction, the governance structure of a city um, in terms of dealing with climate change versus what's needed from a state, from a federal government? Um, can you comment on that? Well, for, for me, the most important thing was to make it make sense for all of our communities. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise I couldn't sell it. Because if I'm talking with someone who doesn't know how they're gonna get food on the table tomorrow, they're not really thinking toward 2050. Right. Because it's not impacting their day to day. So part of it was a communications issue. If I go into my mother's bridge club meeting on Saturday, what am I gonna say to her about climate change? She may not want to talk about climate change, but I guarantee you they're going to talk about how high the power bill is mm -hmm. for the mom. So that was, first of all, important. And then to talk about what it means for all communities and why all communities should care and have buy-in. So we were very fortunate in that we had groups like uh, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies who helped us create our climate policy, and we were able to get a grant from Bloomberg um, and that's an important piece because, again, often cities have limited budgets, resources, staff, et cetera. But when you can have other groups, whether it be, well, I won't say the state of Georgia. I don't think that's a really good example. But um, if, if it's the federal government or if it's an outside agency saying, let me help you craft this policy, mm -hmm. um, then that's very helpful. And then secondly, if you have... A city, again, like Atlanta, for example, that's an inland city. People may not think that climate change impacts them because we're not necessarily getting hit by hurricanes and, and we've had a lot of flooding as of late. But when you put it in the context of Hurricane Katrina, for example, and how you had people move into the city, thousands of people move in, that really changed the landscape mm -hmm. of the city in many ways, that then makes sense to people. So it may not be happening in our backyard, but if it's happening nearby and it impacts your city, then that means the policies of that city and that state really should reflect um, what's, what's best for us as a whole. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely agree. Um, mayors and local governments are responsive. They are responsive to the citizens that they serve immediately. You're going to call your mayor or your city government when there's a fire, when you need police, when you need emergency response to a hurricane or a flood. You are not calling the governor's office, you are not calling state police, and you certainly are not calling your member of Congress first. Um, you make that 911 call that goes locally. And so helping communities to be responsive is tantamount to being right there mm -hmm. with them on the front line. And we have the same, you know, that even in environmental groups and environmental communities, we move, we want to move at the speed of light. You know, we see the science and the data and we know it has to change. Communities move at the speed of trust. And there's a lot of trust building that has to take place in order for us to leverage and work together. But let me give you an example of something that I, I am excited about, I see working really well. There's, an, there's a group it's a business, uh, it's called Charger Help. They're out of California, started by two black women who found a problem. And the problem was that with all of this new EV uh, technology coming online and everybody putting it up, it was great, it was going up, but it was not being maintained, which means you would have an EV charging station that was put somewhere, but if it ever went down, it would be 12, 24 hours, two to three days before somebody was able to fix it. And so their whole business model is just to fix the charging stations. Now, I, I love this because I'm from the South. I am from Mississippi. Everybody's uncle or cousin has somebody who is an electrician. And this is a workforce development model that you can train people to be and do what they do on new technology. But here's the kicker when it comes to local government. Mayors have the authority to say, you know what, we have to have um, if we're going to put in infrastructure with this, with the bipartisan infrastructure funding, if we're going to outlay this, we want to make sure that it goes into black and brown communities. We also want to make sure that those are not the communities where it stays down. Because more often than not, your minority communities, if you get some infrastructure in, they're going to be the last spot that it gets put in and the last spot that gets repaired. 
And so as part of like the contracting, what they began to do was to work with communities of color to say that if you're going to have EV charging stations, those stations must be maintained. Just adding that simple language mm -hmm. is something that can be done on a local level. It creates job development, grid stability, renewable energy. It provides a tremendous amount of opportunities, and that can be done on a local level. So thinking in the ways that are responsive to the community, but also creating opportunities for communities is tremendously important. And then here's the last thing. If you did not know this, know it now. Out of all of the, the, the cities in the United States of America, the top five are all led by people of color. The top three, or three of the top five, Chicago, New York, and Houston, are led by African-American mayors. So these are centers of population where you have minority leadership that, again, are thinking about how to address problems in a way that meets what that community needs. That's great. There are about 10 things there that I want to follow up on from both of you. So um, why don't I pick up where you, you just left off with infrastructure? And I think, um, so the infrastructure funding, infrastructure bill is a way that states and cities get funding from the federal government, one of the ways. And I thought one thing I found frustrating very frustrating during the debates about the infrastructure bill is there was this, you know, um, maybe it was a, maybe it was a smaller group, but this idea that infrastructure has to come has to be defined very traditionally as this physical gray infrastructure, right? But we know we know green infrastructure, social infrastructure, cyber infrastructure. We know how important these things are. Um, how do we convince people that those are critical pieces of infrastructure that need the funding at the federal level? Um, to come to the states, to come to the cities, as opposed to, you know, not opposed to, but in addition to funding for roads, for bridges, and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, a lot of times, people have to learn the hard way. And uh, the best example I can give, in Atlanta, three months into my term, we had the biggest cyber security attack of any city in the history of America. And it took us completely down Thankfully, uh, our infrastructure, our public safety infrastructure, water infrastructure, et cetera, was not compromised. But I had just come out of, of a almost two-year mayor's race with forums, debates, not one time did anyone ever ask me about cybersecurity. Hmm. It was about things that people could see. But again, putting it into the context that it makes sense to people. When you think about our infrastructure, you think about the quality of our water, how we protect our water supplies. Uh, it's important that we have funding to do that. But if you go to your tap and you turn it on every day and it comes out and it, it looks fine and it tastes fine, people aren't necessarily um, uh, eager to put their limited tax dollars towards maintaining infrastructure mm -hmm. that they can't see. But it is extremely important, and again, going back to policies, creating policies that you can say this is our goal, this is the funding that we need to support this goal, and this is why it is also important to your community. I mean, absolutely. Cybersecurity is just one example of a way that a major infrastructure door is open to attack community residents. And we so often forget that we are part of a larger global community that experiences a lot of challenges. Right now there is a war in Ukraine. And even in the midst of a war in Ukraine, um, we have to think about the security of American cities, and that goes to mayors. Mm -hmm. So let's say if, you know, Mayor Bottoms would have ignored that. That could have been an open door for a foreign enemy to attack water systems, mm -hmm. to attack um, <clears throat> the electric grid, to in some way inundate United States citizens in a way that is not only harmful to us, but also detracts and takes away from how we're able to address the energy crisis and climate change. So even cybersecurity, yes, is a climate issue. It is an environmental issue. 
national security is an environmental issue. Mm -hmm. And mayors are on the front lines having to figure out how to deal with all of this in very real time. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, and certainly we saw what happened in Texas with the power grid. Yes. Yes. And that's a, as big a wake up call as we could possibly have because we know it's going to get hotter. We know it's going to get, um, the loads on the power system are getting even greater. Yeah. So. I think that is another sort of tremendous opportunity for us to, to, to just dig into how we have to deal with misinformation. I mean, that's part of what cities have to do and what we saw in Texas with the power grid going down and all of a sudden there were all of these pictures all over the internet of oh, the windmills being frozen and they weren't even in the United States. They were pictures from other countries that were immediately put yeah. um, to communities to help convince them as to why they should not believe that renewable energy would be an opportunity to change that. And those were again directed at the mayor's office and local government to say, hey, just in case y'all are thinking about this, don't go this route. Why? Because then the windmills will be frozen and we really won't have any energy. Well, that was misinformation. And the amount of misinformation that we have to manage uh, as we're trying to solve these problems, I think is another key element of what local government has to do and, and why we have to stay on top of that. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, another piece of this from the infrastructure perspective, uh, you talked about like the infrastructure that you can't see, right? And I think that the social infrastructure, right? Making sure that people have a support system, right? And that they have, um, I think we're all working moms, right? And you talked about the, the person who can't pay their, their energy bills, right? And childcare, like how are you supposed to, um, you know, work? How are you supposed to, especially during the pandemic? And so I think those types of infrastructure, that's critical infrastructure, social infrastructure that we need to build to empower people to be able to um, make decisions and to be able to work and, and do what they, you know, need to do to support their families, so. And, and this is a, a conversation I had with uh, Georgia Power, our local uh, uh, power source multiple times. My monthly utility bill, $750 a month, mm. which is my understanding like a small business. My mother, um, who primarily lives alone, told me her utility bill is running 350 to 400 a month. Mm. She's on a fixed income. She lives about a mile from me was talking with my council person who lives maybe three miles from me, had the same story. Um, so what I said to our power company, uh, we, we can't all be using this much energy. There has to be something happening in this cluster. And what they did, they very thoughtfully laid it out, looked at a map, and uh, in this area, the energy bills were higher, so it gets back to the environmental justice. I don't know if it was the construction of our homes. I don't know if it's something else happening there, uh, but the data is real, and I would imagine if it's happening in Atlanta, it's happening mm -hmm. in Chicago, it's happening in Greenville, Mississippi, it's happening all over the country. Yeah, and we hear these stories too about uh, water bills. So people receive high water bills and it's due to a leak in a pipe somewhere that's not even anywhere near their property. Yeah. But how would they know that? How would they be able to you know, find out that information? So. I think it's critical to talk about what the, what the impact is to people who are living on the front lines. Mm -hmm and also incorporating what cities have to do because the same way that I am paying my electric bill, the city hall has to pay an electricity yeah. bill. Right? So the police station has an electricity bill. Mm -hmm. So taxpayers are paying right. for their own as well as for the upkeep of the facilities in the city buildings. So there should be and has to be a conversation around not only what is this impact, but now are we putting the onus on the people versus looking at what the utility companies have the ability to do. It's like you get a little, there used to be a little message at the bottom of the utility bill that says, oh, during the summertime, save more energy, unplug your major appliances. I'm not unplugging my coffee maker for anybody because I need that <laughs> caffeine in the morning. But how much difference does that really make for people who are, again, on the front lines of this crisis, have uh, a measured or fixed income 
where should the responsibility really lie? And, and that's part of it, but it's also part of the solution, the innovation yeah. that students have the ability to be a part of, what mm -hmm. business and philanthropy and how we can leverage the ideas um, to ensure we're measuring and finding those water leaks. What, are, what, what is this new innovation that we can do to help to reduce the costs, to help ensure that utility companies uh, are able to capture and measure? We're doing this at EDF with methane. Um, where, where is this innovation so that we can identify ways to make huge structural change, be assets to cities and business, and to the benefit of that person who is doing the best they can every single day. And I, I, I do think this is where policy comes into play. So if you are doing an energy audit, and I can give the example of someone I know recently discovered she had a squirrel infestation in her attic, and the squirrels had eaten away or used the insulation um, for nesting. So she's now wondering if that's why her bill has mm -hmm. been so high. Well, she has the resources to get the attic restored right. and put the insulation back in, et cetera. But many people don't because we know people are living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think as cities, we have to be very thoughtful in the same way we are creating affordable housing trust funds and doing all these wonderful things to help with affordable housing. Then how do we help people maintain their homes so that when the window is broken or when the furnace is leaking, uh, that this is not a repair that just goes on for years, um, because I don't know about you, but there are many people, I know when you walk in their house into their bathroom, there is a bucket under the sink yeah. to catch the water that's leaking. So I would imagine uh, that water bill is pretty high, but, it, but if people don't have the resources to make those repairs, uh, then it just becomes this very vicious cycle and it goes back to the question you began with on, on environmental justice and, and how can we, as policymakers, impact our communities in a positive way. Yeah. Um, maybe I can turn now to ask each of you a question. I think, Keisha, you might have opened the door for this, although it was under your breath, so um, <laughs> let me ask if it's okay to ask this. I think it's, it's pretty well known how you, you really took a stand against your own state government when it came to citywide COVID precautions, voting rights, and, and other things. I'm, I'm wondering if you can comment on how you navigate working with, with us, say, a, if you're, you know, it's a state government, it's a state legislature, whoever it might be, who's maybe not on the same page with you with respect to climate change or environmental justice. So, you know, the fights make the headlines. The things <laughs> that we work together on, not, not so much. And uh, the reality is, even with economic development, that's something that our, our current governor and I work very well on. Uh, so those policy issues that we do agree on, we work together pretty well. Uh, but uh, again, when that's not the priority um, of the governor or, or the, the party that controls the state legislature, uh, it is difficult to to force anyone to make it a priority. Mm -hmm. um, but again, when you put it in the context of why it matters to communities. So if you put it in the context that if you live in a coastal community in Georgia, uh, this is why this matters, then you can begin to get attention that you otherwise wouldn't have. And it can influence policy statewide. Uh, but it's, it's not, it, it is, it's not a popular topic mm -hmm. in Georgia, and it should be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Heather, I wanted to ask you, so you've worked in federal government, you've been a mayor, you're an organizer, you work um, for a large uh, nonprofit advocacy group, you're working in academia, so I, I don't know if you sleep, but it's a lot of, a lot of different jobs. So I, I wanted to ask you, where do you feel you can make the the biggest impact just yourself, but also how would you advise, you know, many of the students in the audience here? Yeah, I, I capture it as a recovering politician. <laughs> we were talking about that early. How do you turn it off? Um, and, and finding ways to, to, to use that passion about service, public service, 
um, because it's there. And if you have it, God bless you. Welcome to the crazy group of people who have that. We're, we embrace you. Um, the place, though, that is the most important, and I think all work points to, it is to ensure that we are we have access and the right to vote because that is critically important. I was so excited and so proud that, Keisha, you were in that role as mayor of Atlanta at the time that you were, because there's something about being undaunted. Like, it's the reason why we need more people, more diverse people in positions of authority, because that fearlessness to be able to say, this is what we stand for in the community, but at the same time, let's find the places where we have commonality and can work together that's what's necessary in order to solve hard problems. And make no mistake about it, we're solving a hard problem. Um, but the access and opportunity to do that has to come through our democratic process, which boils down to simply the access to vote. And so whether I am talking in academia or even in philanthropy or in nonprofit or in government, it comes down to do we all have access to just the very basis of our democratic process in the United States? Um, and how are we utilizing that? Because that will help us to understand better how we can work, I think, more concise on climate policy. Um, I work in, again, nonprofit. We're, we are nonpartisan. So it is not who or what you're voting for. It is just simply that access to be able to do it in the first place and to be fair about that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to maybe change topics uh, a little bit. I think this might be the last question, um, it looks like. Uh, this is something that came up actually in my class a little bit today. Some of my students are here in that one, way, one thing that I think cities have been trying to do is provide equitable access to green space, um, you know, with, whether it's for climate mitigation or it's for recreation or public health. Um, and that sort of, with it, there's a fear of gentrification, mm -hmm. right? And the gentrification may be not so much the problem, but the displacement that may come with gentrification. So I'm wondering if you could talk about how, how we can do this and if, you know, neighborhoods begin to improve and people are worried about being priced out of those neighborhoods, what are these like combined strategies we can think about to counter that, but just to ensure that we are also considering sort of equitable access to these things? So, uh, in Atlanta, we're divided up. Uh, we have what we call NPUs, neighborhood planning units. My NPU was the last neighborhood planning unit in the city that did not have a park. So I drove past his piece of land every day, and it went up for sale. I said, that would be a great place for a park. It's right next to the neighborhood that my mom lives in. Um, so I was so excited. I'm like, yeah, I did it. And one of my, my mom's neighbors saw me one day. He tapped on the window. He said, who said we wanted a park over here? We don't want a park <laughs> over here. And I'm going... <laughs> said we wanted a park over here like what's wrong with the park but and and he's a he's a really nice funny guy but a lot of times in communities of color we think of parks with crime mm -hmm. that we don't think of it as an enjoyable space we think of it as a, a place where bad things happen after dark so he did not want that next to his neighborhood understandable I, th I think we have to change that conversation. And when you talk about gentrification again, why does this matter to all of our communities? Uh, we just opened up the largest green space in Atlanta several months ago. Uh, if you ever watched The Walking Dead, they used to film The Walking Dead there. <laughs> it was a quarry known as the Bellwood Quarry and it has a very complicated past with uh, inmate labor, and, and mm -hmm. that's another panel discussion for mm -hmm. another day. Uh, slavery by another name, essentially. Very complicated past. The city at some point bought this quarry. We've now filled it with a 30-day water supply. 
uh, emergency water supply and it's beautiful green space. Mm. The challenge is now the communities that lived around this quarry that would destabilize foundation of houses, foundations of houses. Uh, many of those people can no longer afford to live in that community. Mm -hmm. Largest green space in the city and the community is now being gentrified and now explaining to all communities why this is important to all of us is an ongoing challenge. Mm -hmm. right. I think thinking about green spaces in conjunction with every social issue in black communities is powerful. Um, my most memorable IOP seminar happened on the day of the George Floyd verdict. We were discussing, Mustafa Santiago Ali was the guest, and we were discussing the connection between the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Rihanna Taylor, and George Floyd, and climate, and urban heat islands. And it just happened by circumstance that the verdict was coming down on the day of the seminar. So emotions were high, we were all, you know, we were virtual, and at the exact time of my seminar, the jury was getting ready to come out. And so it was this very full conversation where we talked about how the temperature of the asphalt that George Floyd's face was next to was hotter than the temperature outside. Why? Because when you have in black and brown communities more impervious surface, that's concrete, asphalt, the things that do not breathe, versus green space, the temperature is hotter. And hotter temperatures, science has already shown us, are, are just hot spaces for um, increased violence. So we were talking about just the intersections of violence and climate and what that does. And it's not just police brutality, but child abuse, domestic abuse, what that means, and mm -hmm. the fact that it was hotter where his face was pressed to the asphalt. What would be the difference if we had that instead in green spaces? more green spaces, redu reducing urban heat islands in black communities makes a tremendous difference, but it also has an opportunity to reduce crime, reduce harm. At the end of that seminar was when the verdict was announced, mm -hmm. and it was a powerful reminder to all of us that everything that we deal with, whether we think it's connected to climate or not, is connected to climate, mm -hmm. and there's a solution when we just sort of think and put our heads to right. what should happen. Right, absolutely. I think that's a, a great um, segue to turn to the audience, but that idea of everything being connected to climate is so important. Mm -hmm. and so I think that's, um, that's the way we can maybe get, communicate to everybody that we all need to be on the same page or we all have some stake in this. So mm -hmm. I think um, we're gonna turn to audience Q&A now, so you can line up at the microphone and I, the priority goes to a student for the first question, so. Hi, um, I'm gonna be reading a question from YouTube. Okay. So this person's name is Bronwyn, and they're asking what role can park slash open green spaces play in advancing environmental justice and improved health outcomes in predominantly black and brown communities and how do we ensure park access? Kind of just touched upon this, but it's one of our questions. Yeah, sure. In, in identifying places, you know, if you were identifying the area within that particular community, but looking um, for example, in places where you do have high crime, as a target to understand the temperature difference, what that can mean by doing things like green roofs, white roofs, um, tree canopy, uh, opportunities when you're doing that reconstruction or redesign of a particular area, especially as we have infrastructure funding coming out. If you have to tear up a street, you only want to tear that street up one time. Mm -hmm. So if you've got to replace water lines or sewer lines or you've got some type of construction happening, use that as an opportunity for uh, planning that is inclusive of green spaces to be more effective. And then I think starting with our kids is a great place. Uh, we have what's called the uh, Beltline in Atlanta, and it was an old railway uh, around the city, a uh, 22 mile loop, and it's now being paved, and there's a whole gentrification challenge with this. And I remember as a council person saying to someone, you know, African Americans aren't using the Beltline because it's counterintuitive for us to go walk through the woods. That doesn't seem right. safe. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was an elementary school in my community right next to the Beltline. 
and I got Target and, and some other people to donate some bikes. So then the kids in the community would then get on their bikes, get their parents to walk with them while they rode their bikes on the Beltline. And it's become a very popular mm -hmm. trail because it then made sense to them. Um, that, and, and also it showed them that this is not just for other people, this is for us too. So I think our kids are a great starting point. Absolutely. Hi, I'm here on my first year at the Harris School of Public Policy, and I really appreciate the conversation around talking about crime and safety and how that's sort of inherent link to climate change. And it's like you said, like climate change is linked to everything. And I'm thinking about the movement around like defunding the police and like reinvesting and divesting. Is there a space for us talking about moving sort of funds and resources so we can put it into creating space and creating those structures? Or do we not want to like complicate it with the controversy of how we talk about um, those structures? I think it's already complicated. So, you know, how local governments identify the best opportunity and the best leveraging of their resources and funding is very important. Um, I wrote a piece once just to talk about um, something as simple as uniforming, right? Every major police entity, when they go into a contentious situation, it seems like the more contentious it is, the more black they're wearing. And the only thing I could think about is, aren't they hot? <laughs> Are we not creating more of a problem um, by increasing the temperature just by, by virtue of how much and what they're wearing? Are there not other solutions? And so allowing the local entities to really think through these opportunities, I think is more of a creative way versus branding it something, because the branding is what puts up the walls. Yeah, yeah and I, I think special interest groups do a very good job of getting attention when it comes time to allocate budgets. Each year at budget time, you have people show up in their t-shirts to advocate um, for whatever their specific issue is, whether it, it's trees or parks or whatever, it may be. Um, I think that's also a good place to diversify the conversation um, because a lot of times, again, communities that are dealing with layers of other issues aren't necessarily focused on mobilizing to get more funding for trees. Uh, but I do think many of the organizations that are great at mobilizing and getting the attention of government um, can begin to maybe have, uh, help government have that conversation in communities, so it doesn't seem as if it's an, an, an either or proposition. We can support this in your community, and we can also support that in your community. Hello, so this is Jose. I'm a postdoc at the astronomy department. Thanks a lot for the beautiful conversation. So in Europe, there is this idea, which is very trendy now, of like 15 minute cities, meaning that uh, you should be able to walk uh, to work within 15 minutes, do your groceries, walking within 15 minutes, have a bar within 15 minutes, go to a bar within 15 minutes. And this feels to me like it's an excellent idea to make a community strive. So I, I wonder if you have thoughts of how this could be implemented in the US. Um, yeah. Um, you want to start? You yeah, it, it, it's tough. <laughs> Yeah. Um, because you're talking about wanting 15 minutes to walk to a park. You also want to be able to have a fresh food source within 15 minutes. And that, that's very difficult because then you're getting into how do you acquire land and how do you make the, the private sector uh, bend to your will when these things are needed in your community. So what we had great success in doing, um, I, I mentioned the identifying green space, expanding uh, green space, but also encouraging people to create urban gardens, uh, which is a, a great concept and conversation starter because many people uh, grew up in, in rural communities and, and are fairly new, one generation, two generations into bigger cities. So the thought of creating a, gar a garden and community gardens um, are very appealing to people and it gets the interest of a lot of people. But that, it's a very difficult conversation because we only have limited resources. Yeah. I, I think it's, it, is, it, it 
has to be willing to address the hardest hit communities first. When you go into what you visualize as a livable, walkable city, take note of what you see that makes it livable and walkable. You see sidewalks, curb and gutter, sewer, you see sewer grates, the way that leaves and things are not right there on the street. You don't see cracks in the sidewalk. You see them wide enough that, uh, that, that requires um, access to land and property. It also requires that we go back and fix the structure of many of these spaces and that we allocate the funding there first. And so if communities and government and business are willing to put the funds into the places that have gone without first, yes, there's an opportunity. But without that willingness to put people who have been left behind at the forefront, it then becomes there's a privilege to live in a walkable community. Mm -hmm. It's not that everybody has equal access to it. Yeah, and that, that was a big argument um, in Atlanta too because there was a policy uh, that if the sidewalk was in, ex in front of your home, you were responsible for the repair mm -hmm. of that sidewalk. So you had people up in arms wanting their sidewalks repaired and other people saying, I just want a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> So it, 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 it is, it's definitely an equity yeah. conversation, and uh, it's a very complicated and expensive one. I think if I could just add to that too, I think Heather, your point about um, you know, prioritizing communities, because if you look around Chicago, there's plenty of 15 minute communities, and then there's plenty that are not at all, mm -hmm. and um, take someone an hour and a half to get to work in, within the city from certain neighborhoods. And, and as we create more 15 minute cities, communities in the wealthy areas, we push people out even further and away from those. So I think that's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, my name is Hugh and I'm a first year in the college. Um, I'm from Atlanta actually, and it's unique for a lot of the reasons you mentioned today, um, like green space and all that. It's also unique for um, like urban sprawl and the kind of scale that that's happening at. I was wondering um, as mayor, how did you kind of address the um, issue or just think about um, Atlanta's physical growth, um, both through like environmental lens, but also through all the social and economic kind of factors you've been talking about today. Yeah, that, it was a very tough conversation because you know we are a large metropolitan area. The city itself is not that big. It's the metro area that's huge with each with separate governments uh, and, and their own policy makers. So we really try to put it under the banner of what we call One Atlanta and what that meant. An equitable and resilient city and, and there were some other bullet points under that. And then tried to put the conversations regarding climate, resiliency, sustainability, all of those conversations under that bucket. And then and again, make it make sense to people. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about climate and we talk about the temperature in Atlanta, which is already really, really hot. Uh, you talked about voting, and now you can't even hand out water right? for people <laughs> to vote in the summertime, but that's another conversation, too. Uh, that, that, you know, the temperature rising by five degrees by, or four degrees by 2050. Uh, simplifying the conversation so that our communities would have interest and buy-in um, in the policies that we needed to create. So we had a great office of sustainability, again, doing a lot of work with some tremendous partners, um, setting some goals, clean energy goals, um, transitioning our, our city's fleet to clean energy by 2035, uh, better buildings challenge, uh, incentivizing um, uh, private companies uh, with buildings to reduce their, their energy consumption. I think the reduction was by 20%. And again, just talking about it, talking about it, talking about it, and reminding people why it matters. Hi. Oh. Hi, I'm Sean. I'm a first year in the college. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting and inspiring talk. I just had a question about your discussion at the beginning about environmental justice and how environmental issues disproportionately affect marginalized groups. And one of the groups you mentioned were indigenous people. And given the recent discourse about how indigenous people should be leaders of the environmental justice movement, especially given 
that indigenous communities tend to be better at sustainably managing natural resources. I was just curious whether not only in your time as um, mayors of your respective cities, but in your involvement in public service, if you ever had input from indigenous communities on environmental issues, and if so, what that input looked like. So yes, um, and, and thank you for asking that question because uh, recently the, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, released a, their mitigation report that uh, pointed to indigenous communities as the place that we should look to for natural solutions. In essence, this report basically said, indigenous people told y'all years ago how to do this, go back and do what they told you to do. Um, and one of the roles I served in was regional administrator for EPA in region four, where there are six federally recognized tribes. And in region four, listening to the leaders from the different groups, it, was, it really gave a lot of insight in, insight into how important and integrated the protection of natural resources are to the culture. And what we, I think, both in the United States and really globally have to understand is that if we're really going to talk about the protection of our most valuable resources, we have to also protect the people who are on the front line of protecting those valuable resources. We have to understand and really look at what they're talking about um, when we think through the Amazon rainforest and what has to happen there uh, in terms of decarbonization, protecting that land space, and relying on the indigenous communities that are in that space in the global south, as well as in the United States of America. It is a very difficult conversation, but I think we're doing at least a, a bit better of a job of respecting indigenous lands and people, realizing that the way that they talk within our organizations, um, they're not a state, right? These are actual, they, they are their countries and lands. I, I learned that the hard way. I remember once um, I was speaking with the, the elders of a tribe and they wanted to talk directly to headquarters, not to, to me in the region. And I was like, well, I thought that was my job here. And somebody <laughs> said, no, 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 no. They're a country and they see their relationship with the United States the same way that Germany and France see their relationship with the United States. You are simply the, the go-between the two. I respect that that completely changed mm -hmm. our relationship mm -hmm. and changed the way that we thought about how we work with them. And I, I don't recall um, that input, but I will make that recommendation to our new mayor mm -hmm. in Atlanta because I think that's a, a fantastic recommendation, but I don't recall specifically receiving that. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Emily. I'm a first year grad student at the School of Public Policy. Uh, I was at the session on Monday, and so talking about clean energy and climate policy, new jobs, um, some, a theme that kept coming up was how climate policy actually can create this competitive advantage for cities, new charging stations, new jobs. And I thought that was an interesting way of thinking about it. And one, one thing that I'm still wondering is about as like larger cities roll out, new climate policy, you know, green, uh, greener initiatives, does that actually make it easier for, for smaller communities or nearby cities to then roll it out? Like, is there communication that, that can happen to make that roll out faster? Or is it really something that is an economics driven too? We, we borrow a lot from each other. We often aren't that creative. We look to other creative mayors like <laughs> Heather and, and other leaders, and we, we borrow a lot. So it always makes it easier when someone else is doing it. Or, and I gave the example of Bloom, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies when they issue a challenge and then you can look at a goal that you are trying to achieve. I know uh, what I began to see in Atlanta, because we had been thoughtful about transportation and, and uh, mass transit in the city, and many of the surrounding areas had not, when it came time to get global headquarters for companies, uh, we were given a competitive edge because we had been thoughtful in that regard. So it's now made other uh, surrounding cities and metro areas think about how they expand 
transit and, and make their communities more accessible. So I would imagine in the same way that we were able to get an edge that way, um, that with environmental policies, you'll see other communities replicating that because they often don't have the resources um, and manpower and woman power to come up with policies that are effective. And as like a quick follow-up, does that promote more collaboration like across the state, kind of once, once larger cities are taking the initiative? Um, I, I think, it, it, so it, it, it is a con working together in conjunction because what your larger cities are doing um, and what they, what they do have a huge asset to serve as is places where we're able to scale major reductions. So a Houston, an Atlanta, a Oakland, Los Angeles, a New York, these are major ports. And we're talking about global transportation, globally reducing uh, carbon emissions in a way that only these centers can do because of their access points. But that doesn't negate the relationships of smaller surrounding communities that have the ear and message of people. Because in the United States of alone, more people live in rural communities, actually. Um, that's where your, your land space is. And we do need to have what is the active deployment and exercise of the energy ideas that we see in larger cities. Sometimes they can be deployed quicker. Um, as you say, we're borrowing from each other, looking at how to scale something that's working. And then what is that messaging that's happening in those smaller communities that allows us to, to, to move faster? I think we have time for two more questions. It looks like there's a few people. Hi, my name is Gertie. I'm a first year in the college. Uh, thank you all so much again for your time today. Uh, Mayor Lance Bottoms, you spoke about mayors always acting in a state of response. And I'm wondering if that, to what extent that detracts from your ability to tackle long-term environmental issues. And of course, mayors can't silo particular issues, but do you feel there are times when you need to deprioritize pressing but short-term issues in order to prioritize longer term issues and how that you make that calculus and how you can balance that with, as you said, mayors um, acting on the speed of trust and which I imagine is brought about by dealing with short term issues. Yeah, I, I think Heather actually mentioned that, but I'll, I will say what was very helpful for me as a leader uh, was to create this governing agenda uh, one Atlanta and what we want it to accomplish under that agenda and especially in 2020 when lives and everything was completely disrupted it was very helpful in the in the chaos there's already there's chaos normal chaos in running a city and then there was the extra chaos um, of running a city to be able to go back to what our goals were and what we were trying to achieve. And for any leader, that would be my recommendation because there are going to be disruptions. There's the, the nature of cities, it's the nature of, of lives, but you've got to know what, what are your goals. So there is kind of, well, I guess you could call your strike team that you're, you're dealing with the immediate, you're putting out the fires of the day and then there is the team um, that should never be distracted, that their work should mm -hmm. be about long-lasting policy and long-lasting long uh, plans for cities. And I think that we were all tested by that in 2020. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that it's, I'm biased, but I think it's one of the things that is so beautiful about women who are leaders. We're all, we said moms, we, we are really good at multitasking, <laughs> really good at multitasking. And keeping your eye on what immediately has to happen while at the same time planning for the future is something that we have to do every single day. And bringing that to the local leadership is really important, especially at the time of a climate crisis because we can't avoid responding to the hurricanes and the floods and the wildfires and the snowstorms and things that are happening immediately. But just think over the past four years, having to deal with all of those emergencies and people who've been elected to office over the past four years, having to deal with all of those emergencies and now let's add COVID, let's add extreme air pollution, let's add to that 
um, the racial trauma that's taken place in this country. If I think just in the south of Texas, Port Arthur, Texas uh, comes to mind, Port Arthur and Beaumont, they are cities that have African-American leadership. They're in the petrochemical corridor. In 2021, I believe, or 2020, they had one hurricane, and then in less than four weeks, they had another one mm. that came right back to back mm. in the middle of COVID. And so the ability to maintain focus on what their long-term goals are for the community and responding to those immediate needs comes as a part of what you have to do. But I also deeply believe that that is what makes mayors so great and makes you know, frontline, local, in-your-face leadership a tremendous opportunity to be on the front lines of climate action. It's because they know the ground. You know the people. You know what's going to happen. And um, have a, a wonderful way of keeping our eyes, again, focused and trained on that immediate need and response, and at the same time, understanding what we need to do to get our communities to move forward. And I just think women do that better. No offense to any of them. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Our last question from, from Joe. Can, can we go on the discussion of urban sprawl for a bit? It seems like a really critical conundrum is that uh, public transportation is a key part of a sustainable city, yet the vast, vast majority of our cities don't have the requisite density in order to support that infrastructure. So as policymakers, I'm really curious how you see the path forward to successfully implementing public transportation is. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I thought of you often when thinking about the Atlanta metro area <laughs> and rail and air and mm -hmm. all of those things. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's a frustrating conversation because infrastructure, transportation infrastructure is so very expensive. So uh, as a council member, for example, I fought really, really hard to get expansion of light rail in my community. Um, and now the conversation has gone to BRTs, LRTs, I can't remember all the acronyms. Uh, and, you know, the case is being made, it's much more effective and efficient, better than light rail. And I'm going, so now you, I, I've got to be completely re-educated, and now the community has to be sold again. Once we had told them light rail, you can't get heavy rail, but we'll get you light rail, and now you're telling me you're going to get me fast buses and dedicated lanes. So it, the technology is changing often faster than our mindset and our willingness to change. Um, but what I am a bit frustrated about, um, but also pleased about at the same time, there is now statewide coordination on transit. But then that gets into the conversation on penalizing cities like Atlanta that prioritize transit. And now we're having to share the resources with other counties and cities that didn't prioritize <laughs> transit because the needs are, are so many. So it, it is, uh, it's, it's frustrating to say the least, but it's all about money, which is why Build Back Better, Infrastructure Bill, all those things are important because we need those federal dollars to make it happen. I, I think it is definitely a, a conundrum is a, a light way of putting it because globally we have to be involved with how other countries are not only moving people and product but as you said keeping up with the technology. So it's extremely frustrating and difficult when we can look at other countries that have put in place the technology and are making these advances. And as you say, we're still trying to figure out whether or not we want buses in a dedicated lane uh, and what that's going to do with pollution and health versus uh, other countries in Asia that are getting people to and from a particular place within moments. And the technology is constantly changing and moving. Ultimately, it will be a combination of business and policy and community that gets us to that place to keep up with what's happening globally. Where we want to see the businesses locate is in communities, and especially the communities that need the jobs. And they have to be able to utilize transportation that is effective and that is efficient. Um, and that is cost-wise as well, and is helpful for our environment and climate. So is it going to come? Yes. But is it going to be, I think, um, a deep conversation within communities? Absolutely. And the earlier we bring communities into the conversation, the better we are for it. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. 
Great. Well, I wanted to thank um, our speakers for the fascinating conversation and to everybody here and the students for their questions. I just wanted to remind you that um, Mayor Tony is a fellow at, at EPIC, correct? Mm -hmm. And um, Mayor Bottoms is a fellow at the IOP. So they're, they're giving talks all quarter, I believe, and they have office hours. And I would encourage um, everyone and, and all the students to, to further engage and further talk about these issues. So thank you so much for letting me join you today in this conversation. It was wonderful. And thanks to our sponsors. Thank you.